Hello again, this is Dan Olds and this is another HPC channel webcast for The Register. I'm with Gabriel Consulting Group and today we're going to talk uh, quite in depth about how do you power and cool these massive supercomputers. Specifically, we're going to talk about how Oak Ridge does it. That's the Oak Ridge National Laboratory for those of you that aren't familiar. And with us today we've got Buddy Bland. He's the project director for Oak Ridge and uh, he's been in HPC for quite a while, 32 years, 27 years of those at Oak Ridge. Uh, say hi, buddy. Hi, Dan. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Doing great. That's quite a few machines you've, you've uh, had your hands on. So we have had a, a, a huge number of machines over the years in my career here uh, and from many, many different vendors. So we've had a series of, of Cray machines going back to the Cray XMP. Uh, we've also had a, a, a several IBM machines, uh, several machines from Intel, and then many, many other com companies also. Yeah, you've been around the horn in terms of, of watching what's happened with HPC. and We've gone from uh, sort of the handcrafted, one-off, fully proprietary systems all the way to the massive uh, commodity-based boxes. Yes, and, and today's systems in, in many ways are, are moving back towards those handcrafted systems in that uh, they are so large, every every installation of these very large supercomputers really is a custom machine. They use commodity parts, but uh, the integrators, uh, Cray in our case, uh, has done a, a tremendous amount of work to put in the kind of uh, capability that you need to be able to make these large systems run reliably. Uh, a lot on power efficiency, which we'll talk more about. Uh, so they really are, in many ways, custom systems today. I've, as we're going to see in the slides coming up, you guys are also doing some pretty interesting things in terms of, of managing power, measuring power, and also cooling, which is uh, vastly interesting to me since I've installed, built, installed, and managed exactly two liquid-cooled uh, computers myself. So we have a lot in common there. Absolutely. I'm sure absolutely. we're doing exactly the same thing, exactly the same approach. It'll be interesting to compare I'm notes. I'm sure you're right. <laughs> well, let's uh, jump into it. Taking a look at uh, the first slide, we see a nice picture of uh, of the lab. And what, you guys built this particular facility in 2002? Yes. Uh, we had been, for many years, had a, a, a small 7,000-square-foot computer room that was built in office space uh, in a building that had been built back in the Manhattan Project days of Oak Ridge National Laboratory back in the 1940s and 1950s. And uh, we even installed a liquid cool Cray X1 system in that room with only an 8-inch raised floor, which was quite a feat uh, eight to get inch. people under there to... An eight-inch raised floor, <laughs> and we got the pipes connected and actually got it to work in that room. Well, but you, uh, well, it was wait, very wait, clear wait. that our aspirations were could not uh, go with that. So, with an eight-inch with an eight-inch raised floor, what'd you do to get the cabling and stuff? Did you attach it to snakes or weasels and kind of get them to pull cables and things for you? Well, Cray has this really interesting device that you use to move these computers around. It's kind of like a pallet jack. Uh, and we actually lifted the computer up, uh, blocked it up so it was safe, got somebody under there to hook up all the connections, and then uh, carefully lowered the computer back down onto this 8-inch raised floor. Okay, so you it jacked was, it up. I jacked it up. And noticing here that in 2002, which wasn't all that long ago, uh, you designed towards 8 megawatts, and here we are 10 years later, we have uh, actual discrete supercomputers that are running at about 12, thinking about the K computer in Japan. It is remarkable how much power has changed over the last 10 years. When we designed this machine, really, we were not thinking, this computer building, I'm sorry, not just the machine, yeah. but uh, when we designed the computer building, we really weren't thinking about the long-term needs for power and cooling in the building. Uh, we were looking at what was available then, what we expected to have coming over the next few years, and uh, uh, there were at that time we were at the height of the CMOS uh, scaling curves with clock rate. Uh, machines were not using that much more power when you went from one generation to another, and so that just didn't seem to be the issue that we were concerned about. 
So we designed the building thinking, well, maybe we'll get as high as 8 megawatts of power, but the 2.5 megawatts we put in at the beginning was, you know, we thought that would last for many years. Um, literally, as soon as we uh, finished the building and started working on our, our first computer project, we started to realize that um, we were going to need a lot more power. Uh, and we've done several power upgrades and cooling upgrades over the years. Now we have 25 megawatts of power coming to the building. Uh, we've got about 6,600 tons of cooling, which uh, can cool at 25 megawatts. So it's been a, a, a big increase and an interesting uh, time trying to figure out where to put all those pipes and power cables over the years uh, since the building was really only designed for eight. I can imagine. But we've made it work. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at uh, the crown jewel in that building, and that's going to be Titan here on the next slide. Uh, and Titan's an upgrade of Jaguar. Yes, we. this is one of the, I mean, you, you talk about green computing. Uh, Cray has done a remarkable job in building computers that uh, have lots of components that can be reused. So if you look at the Jaguar supercomputer, we've had a machine called Jaguar on the top 500 list since June of 2005. And here it is uh, in the summer of 2012, so seven years. It's been upgraded many times over that period, but we continue to use the same interconnect cables, the same back planes, uh, the same cabinets and sheet metal. Uh, you know, we've replaced things like blowers. We've added additional power supplies. But much of the equipment in the machine is this, you know, has been the same for, for many, many years. Uh, so you get a lot of reuse out of that. It saves money. It also saves just lots of stuff ending up in landfills. And as we know, electronic components are not the most uh, earth-friendly components uh, when they end up in landfills. So uh, we've been very pleased with, uh, with that technology that's allowed us to do the upgrade. Uh, in going to Titan, we, uh, we continue to use the same cabinets, the same power supplies. We, we put new fans in because they will use a little bit more power per cabinet, and you need a, a larger fan to move that air. Uh, we use the same liquid cooling technology that we used on Jaguar. And so the system is going to go from uh, 18,688 dual socket six core Opteron uh, nodes up to 18,688 dual socket nodes, but instead of two six core Opterons, we'll have one 16 core Opteron, and then in most of the nodes, we'll have one NVIDIA Kepler GPU. So that's going to take the performance from about 2.3 uh, petaflops up to over uh, 20 petaflops, or approximately 20 petaflops, uh, more than double the memory. Uh, but because the GPUs uh, are very power efficient, we expect the power uh, of the system to only go from about 7 megawatts to about 9 megawatts. That's really uh, interesting. And it's still... Yeah, that's a, that's a remarkable number, uh, and in, it's really part of the reason that we chose to go with the, G, the GPU technology is because it is so energy efficient. Titan will be about 10 times the performance of Jaguar, but it's only going to use about 28% more power than Jaguar used in order to get that performance. That's incredible. And let's, let's uh, dive down a little deeper to that, into that on this next slide. And so today, Jaguar is using a little less than 5 megawatts for your average workload, and Titan is going to, only going to go to 7. Yeah, so, I mean, we, we don't have the NVIDIA Kepler GPUs uh, at the time we're doing this recording, so I can't tell you the exact numbers. But sure. based on what we've heard from Cray and NVIDIA, uh, we expect approximately uh, 7 megawatts for the the kind of everyday load on Jaguar running our normal workload, uh, which is, you know, filling the machine up, but it, it perhaps doesn't run quite as hot as when you're running the high-performance Linpack benchmark, for example, which really uh, turns every uh, circuit in the chip on and, and really makes it run quite warm. Uh, so we expect it to be about 7 megawatts. That's a pretty big win to get roughly 10x more performance. As we look at uh, our path from where we are today out to exascale computing uh, by, by perhaps 2020, we see that uh, 
you have really big problems. If we just use kind of normal technology trends and kept doing the same thing that we've been doing over the past few years, we would see an exaflop system in 2020 using about 100 megawatts of power. Now, in the United States, 100 megawatts is uh, about $100 million per year. And, you know, nobody's project can afford that. That's, yeah. uh, that's outrageous. The DOE Exascale project is working to try and uh, has set some targets. Yeah. Uh, and we're working to try and get that power requirement for an Exascale system down to about 20 megawatts. And you're going to have to do a lot of innovative things to get there. One of those innovative things is you're going to have to use processors that use a lot less power. Prototyping that uh, with a system that we believe is of the right basic design to get to exascale, it's certainly not, you know, not there yet, but the right basic design is to use lower power processors, to use uh, very explicit techniques for managing memory and uh, uh, maintaining data locality. So put the data someplace and don't have the computer moving it around for you because that's very expensive from power mm -hmm. standpoint. And actually, if I'm looking at your numbers here, that million dollars per megawatt per year is a bit on the optimistic side because you're, you're paying more than that, uh, even located in Tennessee. Well, so the numbers on the slide, the five megawatts is for the system. The, uh, the $8 million uh, includes a lot of other things besides just the system. So that was really my total power bill with uh, several computers and... Uh, and all the disk drives and all the networks and, uh, and the cooling and sure. so forth. So that's, that includes more things than just the computer itself. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think that it's possible to get to exascale on a power budget of 18 or 20 megawatts? It's going to be very, uh, very difficult to do that. Uh, we've had a lot of discussions with many vendors, and uh, vendors have come up with techniques on how we might do that. And so, um, yeah, I think it's doable, but I think it's going to require uh, – the machine will not look as, uh, as much like computers do today as we would perhaps like. And so uh, it will require a lot of effort on the uh, programmer side to be able to effectively use those computers. And so – we really see Titan as an evolutionary path along this way that starts making it um, important for the users to figure out how to get more parallelism out of their codes, uh, and then perhaps even more importantly to manage the data motion, uh, to put the data where you want it, keep it there, and uh, not move it around a lot because mm -hmm. moving data is very power expensive. Mm. Let's take a look on the next slide at some of the specific things that uh, you're doing at Oak Ridge. Uh, you want to walk us through some of these uh, pictures and bullet points we have? Sure. Um, when we, you know, shortly after building the building, we, we started uh, looking at the power efficiency aspects of the building. Uh, it was one of the first LEED certified buildings uh, in the country back in 2004 when we did this. Uh, and, you know, we did a lot of things right. We didn't do everything right, but we did a lot of things right uh, in building the, the, the building to get the efficiency really high. I mean, one of the key things is um, you want to keep voltages as high as possible uh, all the way up to the edge of the computer because when you lower voltage, uh, that raises the, the power, uh, the amperage that has to be uh, used in the power lines to get the same amount of power. And uh, so, and when you do that, the, um, the resistance kills you, and so you get a lot more electrical losses. So we bring 13,800 volt power right into the building. We have electrical rooms that are literally 20 feet away from the computers where we have 13,800 volt power lines uh, bringing that power in. Um, we, we worked with Cray to make sure all of these computers could run off of as high a voltage as possible. Uh, the, the highest commercially available uh, power supplies, highest voltage commercially available power supplies. Yeah, the 480 volt power supplies, it, it really makes a huge difference. When we first started working on the, the design of Jaguar, we had thought about using 208 voltage. Uh, and 
we looked at what the power cords were going to look like. Every one of those 200 cabinets in Jaguar was going to need two power cords that were the size and diameter of my wrist. Huh. Uh, by going to 480 volts, we could get one power cord that's the size of my thumb. Now, that when you do that across 200 cabinets, that comes out to a million dollars just in the cost of the copper in the power <laughs> wire. Wow. Uh, just to save on, on those losses. So, I mean, that's a huge deal to go to the 480 volts. And uh, essentially everything in our computer center today runs off 480 volts. And what, what can't, if, if there are some servers and so forth that don't run on 480 volts, we're putting transformers uh, in the computer room right beside right the there. equipment to snip it down from the 480 to the 208 or 110. But you're, the, you're snipping the, it down. The you're snipping it down as close as you can to the to, to where it's being consumed. Again, to Absolutely. minimize on that Absolutely. loss. Yeah. And you're a big enough customer purchase here that you can get a lot of the custom things done. It's probably saving money on both sides, on the vendor side and on your side. Well, absolutely. And uh, I think that after we went through this, Cray realized that it would not have been feasible to build the machine, uh, a machine like uh, Jaguar using 208 volts. But when we first started it, again, this was a long time ago, we didn't realize how important that high voltage was going to be until uh, our engineers and their engineers sat down and started kind of actually laying out the system and realizing how much power we were going to have to put in there and how many power cables we were going to have to put in and said, this doesn't make sense. we got to go back to the drawing board and find a, a better power supply. And everything's liquid cooled. Everything is liquid cooled. Um, we use uh, on the next slide. I'll, I'll go into the details of the cabinets, but uh, we do have, um, for example, variable speed chillers uh, that uh, cool the, the water that we circulate throughout the computer room uh, to cool the cabinets. Those variable speed chillers save a tremendous amount of energy because uh, you really want to match those compressors and those chillers to exactly the performance they need. Tennessee, uh, where we're located, is a um, is a fairly hot and humid area much of the year, uh, oh, yeah. and and getting humidity out of the air turns out to be very expensive. Uh, it takes, you know, that if you go back to uh, uh, high school physics, uh, you'll remember the that heat of vaporization that you had to have to to be able to boil off something. Well. To condense liquid out of the air takes a tremendous number of calories of, uh, of energy, mm -hmm. and so we want to we want to keep the machine room as, as dry as possible so we don't end up with too much humidity. So we put uh, vapor barriers on all six sides of the, the computer room, you know, top, bottom, and all four walls, uh, and we keep a positive air pressure inside the room so that when somebody opens the door, you don't get a lot of humid air uh, coming in the room. Instead, uh, you blow dry air out of the room, and then the makeup air uh, gets treated on the way in. And then while we don't use a lot of UPS, because the big supercomputers are not on UPSs, um, we have all of our disk drives, our networks, our servers, everything that's required to run the supercomputers we put on UPS. And we're using a, a rotary UPS system uh, where you've got a flywheel spinning at 50,000 RPM, a carbon fiber flywheel spinning very, very quickly. Uh, and that can generate power for us for long enough for a diesel generator to kick in and, uh, and be able to pick up if the power drops. So all of those things are much more efficient than perhaps other techniques of doing things. So it really has helped. And, you know, that gets our PUE, our power, utiliza excuse me, power utilization effectiveness, down to about 1.25, uh, which means for every one unit of electricity that's going to run the computers, we, we bring 1.25 units of electricity in the building. Uh, so that extra 25% is going to things like lighting and cooling and uh, taking humidity out of the air you know, uh, and losses on power supplies. But that's a very that's low a number. Very that's a very good number. It is. And so it makes us one of the world's most efficient data centers. Uh, there are centers that use uh, that have lower numbers than that. Typically, they are in areas that are um, have cooler climates, so they don't get a much as much heat gain, and drier climates, so they don't have to take as much humidity out of the air. And some of the better PUEs that I've seen 
are, you know, I want to say kind of along the lines of experimental and less maybe of a day in, day out working supercomputer center. That there Well, I, I think I think that's true. There are some, but uh, there are at least two big computer centers that have come online in the last year that uh, that have PUs, PUEs or claim to have PUEs uh, of, of less than 1.1. Uh, and both of them are in much cooler climates uh, and drier climates than where we're located. And uh, I mean, I, more power to them. I, I think oh, sure. that's great. I'm uh, I'm uh, very pleased. And what they're typically able to do in those areas is um, instead of having to run chillers to get a PU that PUE that low, you really can't run a chiller to cool the computers. Mm -hmm. uh, so you either have to use once through air and just blow, you know relatively cool air from outside through the computer and then blow the hot exhaust the hot air out of the building or you have to um, uh, go to uh, a technology that uses like evaporative cooling so if you're in a very dry climate uh, you can use evaporative cooling and uh, and and cool off the room that way you know there's plenty uh, of real but, estate up in Alaska if you guys want to start moving up there yeah I was told that actually the the premier place in the world to put a data center would be Iceland because they have the volcanoes oh, so they can yeah. generate the electricity from, geo, power. from geothermal power and then they have the cold uh, air to cool it off. So uh, perhaps we'll move all of our computer centers to Iceland. Well, you're also surrounded by uh, water. You could use uh, a liquid source. You could use that to diffuse some heat too in their, I don't know, two weeks of summer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's take a closer look at the at the racks and the system that you're u the the cooling system that you're using here. What's going on in this picture? So this picture shows a side view of one of the Cray XT5 or XK6 racks, uh, one of the racks in Jaguar and Titan. Uh, so what you're seeing is uh, how the liquid cooling works. So. Uh, the kind of cream-colored boxes are where the node boards are. So you've got 96 nodes in each one of these racks. This is a standard 19-inch rack, about four feet deep and two feet wide. Um, and so the big round cylinder at the bottom is the fan blowing the air up through those racks to cool them. Well, you, right at the at the bottom above the fan, you see a, a, a arrow that says inlet evaporator. Uh, and that is one evaporator, and then at the top of the rack, on top of the green uh, little uh, wedge up there, are two more evaporators. Think of these as radiators from your car, mm -hmm. but instead of having water run through them, they've got liquid R134 refrigerant. That's the exact same refrigerant that's in your air conditioner on your car. It doesn't in, uh, impact the ozone layer. It's uh, you know a freon substitute. Uh, mm -hmm. But unlike in your car where you have a compressor uh, and you have to run it through an expansion valve and it evaporates and gets very, very cold. We're not doing that. Our Cray isn't doing that in, in, in these racks. What we're doing is just running liquid R134 through the racks. And that evaporates at a fairly uh, low temperature. And so the air coming in at the bottom uh, goes through that inlet evaporator. That conditions it down to about 68 degrees if it's not already there. Mm -hmm. blows up through all those uh, cards. When it comes out of the top of the rack, it's about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty hot. If you had to just take that air and move it around the room to an air handler, cool it off, and pump it back under the floor, uh, it just takes a huge amount of energy. Oh, yeah. It would take about another megawatt just to move all that air around the room. But you've already got the air moving with the fan in the rack, so take advantage of that. And so at the top of the rack, you've got these evaporators. The R134 flows or, uh, just boils off because of the heat. That 120-degree uh, air uh, coming through there boils the R134. The, uh, the air comes out at the top at about 75 degrees, and the R134 vapor then flows back through pipes, uh, to a heat exchanger that we have at the end of each row, and that heat exchanger has about 100 gallons of cold water running through it every minute. And, that, uh, and that's what's that, taking the heat out. 
That's what's happening. That takes the heat out. So that condenses that vaporized R134 back into a liquid and restarts the cycle again. And so it's just a very small pump rather than a big compressor and expansion valves. And the real advantage to this is that if you had an expansion valve and a compressor, you get condensation on these pipes, and then you have to deal with making sure that you don't get water dripping down in the electronics. Yep. With this system, the physics of the system prevent any condensation. Nothing ever drops below the dew point, and therefore, you never get condensation, and you don't have to worry about the water. So it's a really nice technology. It's very clean. It's very neat. And uh, Liebert actually sells this technology. They developed the technology in the, uh, initially, and uh, they sell this uh, uh, as a commercial product that can be used for, uh, they call it their high-density product, high-density cooling product. They sell it for, it's an add-on to just commercial racks that can go in any data center. Well, and Cray has adapted this technology to run on, on their, their machines. The other thing, too, is that you're not directly attaching anything to the servers themselves. You're not, this isn't a direct connect of water blocks no. at all. No. I mean, in any fact, server can go in these things. Absolutely. In fact, the, the cabinets themselves uh, can be run air-cooled. So Cray can sell this exact same cabinet in an air-cooled configuration. They just pull off that uh, the, the radiator on the top and pull that radiator out of the bottom. And if you have you know a small number of racks where you don't need to uh, do the, uh, the liquid cooling, um, then you can use exactly the same rack, and it works, works well for that. On, the, on your drawing here, looking at the uh, fan apparatus below, is that to scale? Because it looks like you use, lose a reasonably large chunk of, of cabinet capacity to it, or is that kind of blown up in order to show what's there? It's, it's pretty much to scale. I mean, this is a drawing that's courtesy of Cray. They, uh, they made this, and uh, so I don't know the exact dimensions, but it's pretty close. Uh, it's a big fan, and it's one, in fact... Uh, it's one of the things that uh, Cray developed is this particular turbo fan that could move a lot of air through this cabinet because you've got three uh, three bays, three chassis of, of computer blades, so you got to move have a pretty high velocity of air moving through there to cool all of those parts. And the servers are laid out as blades, right? Right. There's four nodes on each blade. Okay. And uh, 24 blades in the in the racks for a total of 96 nodes. Yeah, 3,200 CFM is quite a bit of airflow. Yeah, absolutely. So we're not heating the room at all, though. I mean, the air that's finally no, coming out is, uh, what, so 70 degrees, 75 degrees? It's, com it's completely room neutral. It will, uh, in fact, uh, when we first installed it and we were doing the, the tuning of the cooling system, uh, it kept getting too cold in the room because we were actually cooling the room more than we needed to. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, it is completely room neutral uh, as we've got it running now. In fact, one of the interesting things, I'm, I mentioned that Tennessee has a lot of humidity here. One of the interesting problems that we had is when we first tweaked it, uh, we had it exactly room neutral. And there was not enough heat load in the room for the rest of the air conditioners to ever come on. So we were at, eventually you would get a little humidity in the room and nothing was ever taking it out. So we had to actually tweak it so that it put a little bit of heat into the room just so the rest of the air conditioners would come on to remove the humidity. You know, one of the things that you hear a lot about is finding a way to use the waste heat. You said in, in this that the the final temperature of the air when it hits the top is around 150 degrees Fahrenheit. and 120. 120. 120 excuse me. I'm not sure. Yeah. Is there any way to use that waste heat effectively? Today, uh, so coming out of the top of the cabinet, we don't know of any way to use it. Um, when we capture the heat in the water, the, the, the change of temperature in the water from the input side to the output side is only about 7 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And there's just not a lot of work you can get out of 7 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Now, if we could, if we could get that to be, you know, 50 degrees Fahrenheit or, or more, then I mean, I, I'm not a mechanical engineer, so I don't know the exact numbers that it would need to be. But we have looked at ways that we could uh, raise that temperature more and uh, effectively use that heat. But so far, uh, right now, we're not using the heat. Uh, we would love to find a way to recover that heat uh, and use it more effectively.
But this is a really interesting system. The thing I like about it is that it's not an, a, a lot of customization and it doesn't force any sort of compromise on the server side. Correct. It, it really has worked very well. We've been using this system since 2008 when we installed uh, the, the 200 cabinet Jaguar petaflop system. And uh, it has just worked remarkably well for us. We've been very pleased with it. Well, let's shift gears a little bit. And on this slide, talk um, a bit about how you guys are tracking um, your power usage. And it looks like you've well, done quite a bit. Yeah, Dan, we, we have done a tremendous amount. I mean, there's a lot of detail here that uh, the listeners may want to dive into. But the, the bottom line is we have put meters on every uh, uh, service delivery panel, you know, the switchboards, the power distribution units, everything throughout the computer center so that we can measure where our power is going. And that's turned out to be remarkably uh, important for us to find out exactly you know, as you're trying to get that PU, PUE down to 1.25, figuring out where all the power is going and where the where you can uh, cut power usage uh, requires measuring it everywhere. Uh, on the right side, we talk a little bit about some new power monitors that we've put in that give us substantially uh, additional capability. As you're trying to get down below 1.25, You've got to start looking at things like the harmonics that are introduced on the uh, switchboards by uh, power supplies and switching power supplies and so forth, and and voltage transients and and all of these kind of things that are uh, you know you, you need a, a an advanced degree in double E to to go through, but all of these are really important because harmonics mean that you don't have the uh, uh, everything balanced properly and you get all kinds of uh, uh, strange power usage and you'll get weird numbers out of your power usage uh, when you when you have these. So these meters have turned out to be uh, remarkably important for us. We monitor you know, every power supply in our, not every power supply, excuse me, every power panel and circuit uh, in our computer room uh, to be able to work on keeping our PUE as good as we possibly can. And where you monitor it, I'm sure you're, you're also keeping logs and I would hope, I would imagine that you guys probably have some pretty sophisticated tools for going through and spotting anomalies or, or ways to improve. We do, and we, uh, we have very good power uh, capability. The Tennessee Valley Authority is our utility company, and, and we're a direct supply customer from the TVA, so we get power into the laboratory at from three separate places in the TVA power grid at 161,000 volts. And we just don't see any transients on those lines. But, you know, once it gets down at ground level and starts moving around the laboratory, uh, we sometimes have a squirrel or a raccoon who decides uh, he wants to, uh, you know, commit suicide by chewing through the, the transformer <laughs> wires or something. And uh, so occasionally you'll get funny spikes and so forth. And um, so we really have to pay attention to these kind of things on the system. Excellent. Well, let's move on to the next slide, uh, talking a little bit more about the PUE. And, and you sort of hit on some of these points that to get to a better PUE, you really need to be in a, a different climate. You're getting that efficient. Well, yes, we're, we're down to the point where it, it, in our environment, it um, the, we're kind of at a point of diminishing returns. To get much better PUE requires tremendously more cost. And so, you know, when you look at payback periods that are in 50 or 60 or 70 years, uh, it's pretty difficult to get anybody to make those kinds of changes. But we are looking at one change uh, as we start looking out towards the exascale computers um, where we're looking at machines that could use 20 megawatts or perhaps more, you know, uh, and we would like to get that PUE down to about 1.1, so, which would be as good as the places which are not using chillers. In order to do that, we would have to get away from using chillers, too. Turns out we're very close to a, a deep water, relatively cold lake uh, for this part of the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, can, um, we could pipe lake water from out of the bottom of that, uh, that lake up to uh, our computer center and use that to provide the cooling uh, and, you know, go through heat exchangers. And then, um, the water going back 
would not be much warmer, and uh, we could put it back in at the depth of the lake where it would go back in at the right temperature. So there would be uh, little or no environmental impact. And um, uh, so we're, we're looking at that. We, we really have to do the design to figure out whether it'll be cost effective, how, what the payback period will be. So along the lines of the way that you'd cool a nuclear power plant. Yeah, in fact, that's, we have a, um, an experimental nuclear reactor that was built on the banks of that lake uh, many years ago. It never was loaded with fuel, but we still have the permits from the T Tennessee Valley Authority to draw the water out of the lake to cool the reactor, and so we could use that water to cool the computers. So it's exactly the same technology. That would be a really interesting, um, very interesting project. That, that makes <laughs> well, a lot of sense. A, the, yeah, but there's, I was just in, um, in Lugano, Switzerland at the uh, uh, Swiss National Supercomputing Center, uh, the CSCS, and uh, they have just undertaken a new computer center. They, it's up online now, and they did a lake water cooling project there. So they piped lake out of water out of Lake Lugano uh, up the hill to their computer center, cool their computers, and then the, uh, the water uh, just runs back downhill to the lake, uh, and it's very efficient, and uh, it makes a lot of sense. Very interesting. And, of course, then you're going to your next bullets here, making the computers more efficient, too. Well, and that's exactly where, where all this leads. Once you've got the building as efficient as you can reasonably make it, uh, if you're going to either with the same power get more computing or uh, with uh, use less power for the uh, computing that you have, you need to find ways to make the computers more efficient. And uh, so that's one of the things that uh, a lot of places have been looking at. So. IBM with their blue gene machines. I mean, that was a, an experimental system, uh, a set of systems um, that was looking at how can you make very energy efficient, uh, very reliable uh, supercomputers. And I think we all see with the Sequoia system, among others, that that's been a remarkably effective project. Uh, the GPU accelerators are a uh, another way to make very energy efficient machines. Uh, as we've talked about before, you get about 10x the computing for the, for about 2x the power. So it's uh, um, it's a a very good way to move forward, and we're we're exploring that. But also uh, having the ability but, to turn those things off when you're not using them, and to have the right absolutely. workloads going um, to the right accelerator, that sort of thing. All of those things are very important, and if you look at the chips that are designed by Intel, by AMD, by NVIDIA, uh, by IBM, all of these chips now have uh, dynamic power management uh, techniques in the chip where the hardware turns itself on and off based on what needs to be done. Uh, it will be interesting over time to see how that impacts reliability of systems and the latency uh, uh, on getting applications to be able to run. How long does it take to start that piece back up again? Yeah. You know, if it's in microseconds, then it probably doesn't matter. But if it's in milliseconds to seconds, then uh, maybe that's too long. So uh, these are all things that, you know, kind of the current generation of machines that are just coming online are going to allow us to explore a lot of these technologies as we go towards exascale. And the availability is going to be a challenge as well. As these systems get bigger and bigger, as we move towards exascale, you're starting to get into the, the tail of the mean time between failure on just the raw hardware. Absolutely. And uh, since clock rates aren't getting any faster, uh, you, you keep adding more chips. And every, you know, uh, to the zeroth order, the number of chips you have in the machine uh, is you know directly proportional to the number of failures you're going to have, and so the more chips, the more failures, and the shorter that mean time to interrupt is going to be. Which, so it's it's really an issue that we we're working very hard on. That's going to demand a lot more sophistication on the software side. It will, and uh, uh, I was I was disappointed that the MPI forum did not adapt uh, the. Um, fault tolerant MPI in the uh, in the latest round of uh, deliberations that they had but uh, I do expect that many of the laboratories will continue to work on uh, experiments with that kind of technology 
and uh, we're working with applications today on fault tolerance in the applications because it's just going to be absolutely required as we uh, move out with these uh, very, very large systems. Well, let's talk a little bit on the next slide about this PUE for computers. I've uh, talked with uh, Natalie Bates, who's working with the Energy Efficient HPC Working Group, and Eric Strohmeyer as well in a previous webcast, um, about getting down to being able to measure what's going on inside the system and develop some metrics. And I, I guess uh, you guys are participating in this as well? Yes, uh, Jim Rogers from our team here has been working with the uh, Energy Efficiency HPC Working Group now for uh, for a good while. Uh, we started getting interested in this back in um, uh, 2008. Uh, on the June 2008 Top 500 list, there were two computers. The number seven machine was uh, Nurse's Franklin computer, which was a Cray XT4. And the number eight machine was ORNL's Jaguar, which was also a Cray XT4. They had roughly the same number of processors. Uh, they got roughly the same uh, score on HPL, yet the, the NERSC machine did it with 1.1 megawatts, and ORL's machine did it with 1.6 megawatts. And I kind of scratched yeah. my head and said, yeah. huh, why is that? And so uh, you know, I'm not sure I can ever answer that question because we don't have all the details on exactly how all the measurements were made back then. But what it pointed out was the need for consistent ways to measure the, the workload, to measure the power consumption, uh, the total power being used in the system. And, uh, and so that's the energy efficiency HPC working group grew out of questions like that uh, and others from people in the community. And so what we're looking for is ways to really measure what exactly is going on in the computers. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, PUE may not be the right term for it, but uh, something like that to be able to measure how efficient each computer is, everything from the power supplies to the fans to the, to the uh, computers, uh, the electronic circuits themselves. Well, we have that on this next slide here is, you know, flops per what or what. Um, having this, yeah. everybody using the same workloads and measuring the same components over the same amount of time. Yes, and so we we think uh, in the uh, energy efficiency HPC working group that in order to continue to make progress, you need a consistent way of measuring uh, all of these things. And so uh, there's been a lot of work uh, over the last few years by the working group to to define exactly what things uh, we should be measuring, how we measure them, how you report results. And uh, there'll be a, a workshop uh, at SC12, a BOF, to talk about those results. And uh, you know, we're looking forward to seeing uh, how all of this goes. And we hope there's a big turnout for the, the BOF at the, uh, at the SC meeting this year. And on this last slide here, I've got a couple of links where people can get uh, more information on that. Uh, it's it's a very interesting effort, and in order to get the kind of improvement that we're going to need to get, we're going to have to measure energy in a consistent and replicable way. Sure, because uh, you could look at a computer and say, okay, I can turn the frequency down, on the on the chips, and it'll use less power to do this uh, the calculations. But if it then takes me longer, and I have to use more total energy, uh, you know, integrated over a longer period of time, then that's not really the the desired outcome, is it? No. So uh, you know, we we really uh, the working group really is looking for everybody in the community who has an interest in this, especially for uh, people who are running big HPC systems. To get involved, uh, to help us out, and uh, we, we're lo really looking forward to it. Well, hey, I really appreciate the time, buddy, and thanks for giving us uh, a, such a detailed and interesting look at what you're doing at Oak Ridge. Great stuff. Well, thanks a lot, Dan. I, I appreciate the opportunity to do it. And I want to check back with you and see how it goes, but particularly when you start uh, piping water from the lake up to the system room. See how that's working out. Yeah, it might be a might be a couple of years before we uh, get down that path, but yeah, we'll be happy to talk to you about it. Okay, well, thanks again, and I want to thank everybody who's out there watching and listening. Uh, this has been another HPC Channel webcast from The Register, and I'm Dan Olds. Thanks for listening.